The next guest is from Iceland, so this session will be in English. In 2013, the Nordic Council Children and Young People's Literature Prize was established, and we are very honored to have the last year's winner, Anna Mar Angrimsson, with us here today. He received the prize for his debut novel, Söl Sagas Unglings, and will be interviewed by translator Janina Olo from the prize committee. A very warm welcome to you both. So glad to have you here. The stage you. is yours. Yes, it's actually a, it's a ple big pleasure being here. So thank you for inviting me and thank you for coming too. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's a little bit too many people for my taste, but <laughs> <coughs> we see how it goes. I think we could uh, play or imagine that we are sitting at home in the kitchen at the table That's a good discussing. Idea. We'll skip the audience. No, we're not Sorry. skipping you. Sorry. So, um, you, as you said recently, you won the Nobel Prize in Literature yeah. for your <laughs> novel, Sjölv och Saga Unglis, and it was your debut. Hmm. How come that you created this pearl as your first book? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, I had always dreamt of being a writer, um, but there were many detours on the way. Um, I was a translator, I, was a, I worked on a, on a ship, uh, worked in the Laxness Museum, and then became a teacher. And I was always writing, and I, I thought that my, if I had any skills, that they would lie in poetry and, and short prose. But then, one summer, four years ago, I just had this epiphany, let's say, that this scene uh, that appears in the second half of the book, um, and that short scene just turned into uh, this novel gradually. And I'm, I'm not really sure what happened, um, if it was just pure luck or if, if a strict routine of writing every day for two or three years uh, helped a little bit. Yeah. Mm. But at what age did you start working on this? I mean, what age, but how many years did you process this novel? Or did yeah, you write it like in the flow? It, it was a flow, but uh, it took three years. Uh, I was teaching more or less full time during the, uh, that period, but of course with uh, uh, summer holidays, and so it was a fruitful time. Did you you had this idea from the beginning that the main character would be this teenage boy, who is sort of out of everything? Yes, uh, it all started with. Uh, with a scene that, uh, how many have uh, have read the book? Come oh. on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> so we could maybe, yeah. That uh, in the latter part of the book, there's this uh, uh, scene, this incident where he is forced uh, to drive a, a car, although he is just, 15, almost 16, and doesn't have a driver's license. And uh, that he is at this moment so forced to leave his, let's say, his rather sad past behind of being very passive, not taking any responsibility, that he is forced to, to grow uh, in an instant out of himself. So. That's, that's the scene I uh, was thinking about, that uh, what, what we need are uh, challenges. Mm. And he hadn't been challenged, let's say, before, that he had had this rather easy and, let's say, depressive life of, of the first, of our first wor world, of having everything and having too much entertainment, but no real challenges. Mm. 
And maybe we should also say that when it takes place, this novel, it's, it's after the economic crisis in Iceland, mm. which is a kind of point of departure mm. for, for the whole story. Mm. But, uh, and we'll get back to this uh, in a few seconds. I just wanted to, when we saw you lifting, raising your hands, uh, how many translations are there? Because I read it in Swedish translation. Uh, that's the the only one that has uh, appeared at the at the time. Okay, but, but are they coming? Yes, there are uh, publishers uh, in Europe and elsewhere reading it and hopefully decided taking the right decision. Yeah, they have to because it's it's a great book. Of course, it won the prize, and it was nominated for the Icelandic prize as well. Yes. And uh, uh, when speaking of translations, I want to say, I want to point out that the Swedish translation is excellent and it's made by Ulva Hellerud, which should be mentioned as well. But this is, a, to me, this is, you could, if you want to categorize, I'm also a literary scholar, I'm not sure that you need to be that in order to read the book. You don't, obviously. But um, uh, if you want to categorize it, now it, it, this is for, for uh, it, you could say it's a young adult fiction. Mm. Uh, but it's also, it's a Bildungsroman in a way, because we ha it's, it's classical in the sense that we have this young male, this young boy, who is uh, leaving, his, he's forced to leave his parents. And that's also because of the economic crisis, mm. which has led to almost the bankruptcy of the family. So father has to go and work in the seas, and mother has to go to Stavanger to yeah, work in hospital. What a coincidence. That's a crazy coincidence. You knew you were coming here. <laughs> that's... I, had, I hadn't given it much thought, but when I got this invitation to come to Stavanger, and it's crazy for an Icelander that this is my first time in Norway, so I'm oh. sorry, but I'm here. <laughs> uh, it happened. The dream came true. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was uh, after the bank crisis, it was very common for Icelanders to uh, go and work in Norway. Uh, either in on holidays or just to move, and in, in his uh, parents' case, uh, they she the mother goes to stomach to work in a hospital, mm -hmm. and another coincidence that uh, on Saturday I had a coffee with a, a friend of mine in the north of uh, Iceland, and said, "Yeah, I was I'm going to Stavanger and." I knew he had been studying in, in Norway. Yeah, 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 I lived in Stavanger. So there were endless connections. <laughs> yes. And, and the father, who's a, he's a teacher or administrator in a, in a college, that he, I mean, there are pretty long uh, summer holidays in Icelandic schools. Mm -hmm. So he goes on a, on a troll or on a ship to, to work, which is uh, not common today. More teachers take, yeah, take their holidays, let's say. But it, uh, it is, and especially some years ago, it was quite common that teachers would have two jobs, that they would work as uh, guides or uh, drivers or seamen or so, whatever in the summer holidays. So, yeah, that, uh, this is yeah, based on this reality. Mm. And at the same time, this is similar to, to the point of departure in many fairy tales, where the hero has to leave the, the parents and go out in the world and, and meet several challenges in order to, yeah. to find himself. But here, um, Selvi, I think we should use the Icelandic name. Yeah. Selvi is sent to his grandmother, and... Um, He's deprived of his cell phone and, and the access to the internet, and he's like isolated. And I've heard from several writers of, of uh, fiction for young adults that this, this um, equipment, this, uh, well, like the cell phone and so on, they, they make a big problem in literature because you get new models all the time. So yeah. it, in order to keep up to date, you should be updating yourself all the time. Mm. As a writer. As a writer. Mm. In, with this technolo technology. Yeah. So it's a very good thing to just deprive him of everything because then you don't have to <laughs> think about this and you can focus on the main problems, maybe. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, technology is, uh, is of course, a theme 
uh, mm -hmm. in the book, but you don't have to be an expert. We we know what what, what it is about. So yeah, but maybe the young readership they know they are experts. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think I I get away with it more or less yeah. in general terms. Well, I think it's I'm I'm happy that you did the way you did it, but I think we should say something about the grandmother, because she is quite a character. And where did you find her? Promise not to tell anybody. Yeah. Um, she is in a way based on uh, my ex father in law, <laughs> 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 who who lives in a farm not far from Akure, my, my hometown. And I owe him so much. We, we, we still uh, meet often as a uh, good relationship there. That uh, getting to know him and his family was my first actual access to the Icelandic countryside. Um, my family is more into the sea and the fisheries and uh, for the first time um, i think i was almost 30 when i when i first uh, went what do you call sheep gathering you know collecting sheep in the mountains yeah. and uh, that scene in the book is is 90 percent based on that experience mm -hmm. and so many uh, many scenes from the farm, uh, some of the, the smell and the food and, and just the, the frame of everything is my uh, staying and visiting and, and doing the odd work on that, on that, uh, on that farm. And his, he is eccentric, like the grandmother. Mm -hmm. He reads uh, at least two or three books a day. Uh, everything between Margit Sandemo and Dostoevsky, so and with uh, with asterisks in the in, in between. So, yeah, there's a there are many things that they have in common. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> you must read the book. Uh, uh, yeah, and literature. Play, plays a great a decisive role in, the, in this novel, I would mm. say, because mm. you have lots of literary references and, lots of, and music is another very important reference as well. Mm. And uh, literature, well, we know that you are, a, you are a high, or used to be a high school teacher. What's, what's your professional situation right now? Uh, yeah, I've been uh a college teacher for what 10 years basically teaching uh, Icelandic literature and at the moment I'm more or less on on leave I teach one one course this this term I have a background in German literature as well and in, in uh, general I'm just interested in languages writing literature and about the references uh, um, there is still, you still find people in Iceland who are generally interested in, in, in books and these are people who are not literary critics or scholars, mm -hmm. just people somewhere in the uh, countryside or janitors at your school or, and also when I was working on, uh, as a sailor, I would, there would be I mean, that, that's 20 years ago, but you would meet uh, laxness experts, you know, on board a ship or wherever. So I thought it was really important to, to address this interest that um, below and not very deep below, there is this uh, this vein, this this really strong uh, connection to lit Icelandic literature and and uh, world literature that really goes way back. Mm. You say it goes way back. Uh, I read someplace that in Iceland, more than ninety percent of the population uh, thinks or feels that literature really is an influential power or has the power to 
influence on, on the life of society. Mm. And that's, that's uh, very impressive, I think. But um, Sylvie is 15 years old. What about his generation today? Because obviously you have, uh, well, this is a portrayal of him to mm. living in today's Iceland. And mm. is there like a gap now? Or? Yeah, there is. I mean, uh, growing, growing up uh, 20, 30 years ago, I mean, the, the book would be so central in Iceland. I mean, more so than in, I think, every other, any other country, that uh, the media television revolution came quite late to Iceland. So until the mid-80s uh, and al almost the 90s, we had not that much entertainment available, you know. Until, what, 86, we had uh, one, we had only state TV, that was quite, you know, that was the perfect, perfect entertainment. Not too much, and no TV on Thursdays, mm -hmm. no TV in July. So it was, it was like just, if your parents would decide how much TV you need, the state would just take care of it. <laughs> but uh, after 1990, I mean, it, it just, everything started to happen. But that is quite late in comparison with Europe and, and the States. So when I was growing up uh, in the 80s, I mean, the book and the libraries uh, would be so central to uh, spend time on a, on a weekend or just after school to, to read a book. And it was not, you, you didn't need any initiatives to, to get kids to read. Mm. But then that st started really to, I mean, around the year 2000 with the, with the explosion of the internet that we, we just, we know what happened after that, that it, that it is really hard to compete. But then again, uh, there is light, like she said uh, here before, that I just have the feeling that it, it takes a little bit longer to uh, for kids to find this interest. I mean, they are, uh, I think high school and college are, are very important in uh, introducing books mm -hmm. and ideas. And, but college and maybe college has never been, you know, the, the time for reading much. It's, it, it's so much about being with people and, and, and so forth. But when I meet uh, old students of mine who are now maybe 25 or something, I, they often talk up to me about, the, yeah, I've, I've started reading books again, you know, after a, maybe a long break. So, but we, we meet, need to put more power into this, mm -hmm. that to strengthen the libraries to, I mean, books are quite um, expensive in Iceland still, but I say that, I mean, being such a small uh, country, there is, it is, if there is will and a little bit of money, it, there is, it is possible to, to see changes happen really fast. Just uh, two things that nobody would think would ever change. Let's say we're in Iceland, let's say 30, 40 years ago. What are, what? does people do in their spare time? They probably drink and they smoke. And now I think uh, we're of one of the, Nordic, of the Nordic countries that, I mean, the, the drinking has diminished and the smoking is almost disappearing. Mm. So this has happened in, in 30 years that like Icelandic teenagers, they are, they drink much less than the generations before. So that gives me the hope of, I mean, with, more political engagement uh, that we could turn around this. We could make uh, the book central again. Mm. And you show this beautifully in, in Selvi's case, I think, because he finds, uh, <laughs> on the other hand, uh, when he gets interested into literature, he's almost forced to get interested because there's nothing to do in the countryside, for, or he thinks there's nothing to do. Mm -hmm. And he tries to avoid work. I love the depiction of him 
just sleeping all day and coming out in the night and hiding away from his grandmother, who, who doesn't abuse him or, or mm. uh, accuse him of being lazy or so. She lives her own life for certain reasons. But uh, I wonder when you picked out, for example, Morgan Cain, yeah. And uh, on the other, Gerpla, on the other hand, how, how, how did you think that? And maybe we should say what Gerpla is. Sorry? Gerpla, what, what kind yeah, of story yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, uh, first with Morgan Cain. You know Morgan Cain? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> High literature from Norway. <laughs> sure. I mean, that, it just really fond memories from, from the, the 70s, 70s and 80s of, you know, yeah, reading all the 60 or 70 books of Morgan Cain, just disappearing into this world of, of, a, uh, of, the, of a cowboy in America. So yeah, this, was, this was really much commonly read in Iceland in the old days, and you, you still see them around. And uh, the boy, he when he goes to this farm to his... Uh, grandmother he in a way inherits the the old uh, room of his father that hasn't changed for 20 or 30 years and in that in that room there are, there are rows of Morgan Cain there are vinyl records and so forth and like you said I mean he he in a way hides from his grandmother he is revolting he doesn't want to take part in in anything and he's just going to sleep his life away or sleep the, the summer away. But you, you can only sleep so this much. So in the end, he picks up a book, the first in the series of Morgan Cain, and finds out that it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> and uh, then he finds other stuff also hiding uh, in hiding b behind the... The Morgan Cain series, but we don't don't go into that now because this is a children's book affair. Fair, but then Gerpla, uh, which is like a common theme in the book. Gerpla is uh, one of Halldor Laxness' uh, most yeah popular or yeah most popular book. Uh, do you know the, the title in Swedish? Or? I think it's Gerpla. Gerpla. No, it's Gerpla. And it has a subtitle as well, which I have uh, forgotten now. Yeah. It was translated by Neville. Yeah. I don't remember. I think there's a, the, uh, the English title is, is quite interesting, and I'm not sure it's good. Uh, the Happy Warriors, I think. Oh, no, it's nothing like that. Really strange. But it, it's a... Uh, some say it's a parody of the... Icelandic sagas. Mm -hmm. it, it's really, it's basically uh, the Fóstbræðra saga retold. And while I was working at the Laxness Museum, I worked there for a year, I would meet people who would come on, on a pilgrimage to the house. Mm. And in many cases, you know, Gerpla was their Bible. And also uh, the farmer the ex-father-in-law, uh, uh, he, his favorite book is, is Gerpla. Okay. And at one time, he finished it, meaning he had destroyed it from reading it, oh. you know, a hundred times or yeah. so. So he had to buy it again. <laughs> and he also listens to it, you know, in his tractor, you know, driving around. And so it, for many, for, uh, for Iceland, uh, Iceland is a certain generation, this is a, a kind of a Bible, you know, of brutal humor, basically. And it's one of these books, like the grandmother says, that uh, you don't read it, you know, from, from beginning to the end. You just open it somewhere, like when you open the Bible and you just read a small chapter. Yeah. <laughs> I have the Swedish translation here, if yeah. I may quote it. Bra med ord, öppna den med jämna mellanrum. Läs en mening och anstränga dig, anstränga dig inte för att förstå. Det är som med Bibeln, det är en trist historia. Men huvudpersonen uttrycker sig ibland roligt. Det är själva stilen som är det fina. <laughs> this is, it's full of scenes like this. And <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, I mean, these... 
these references. I mean, I was not maybe a, a typical teenager. I mean, I would have an uh, eye or interest in all of these things. It just takes a little bit longer now. I think, I mean, everybody back home is always making reference to to certain kinds of poets that are mm -hmm. central. And uh, I don't think that will change in the near future. No. So, uh, the Icelandic saga is very strongly present also, not directly. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what about your own relationship to the saga tradition? Because I, I also read uh, there was a, a critique against critics that uh, uh, in uh, contemporary Icelandic prose, if it's reviewed outside of Iceland, people always try to compare the, the, these works and these books to the Icelandic saga. This is not the same tone as. <laughs> so is it, a, is it a curse or is it a, the other way around? Or how would you describe your own relationship to the saga? <laughs> well, it's a little bit like with, uh, with Gerpla that, um, of course, I've, I've read many of them. And at some point, maybe from the beginning to the end. But lately, I, I browse a little bit more. Hmm. I, I love, for example, I love the style. I, I really, um, I really lo love the, the tone. And I, I really, uh, there is time to rewrite more of these stories, to, to retell them. Because, I mean, they are, m most of them are, of course, quite old, and uh, it takes them like 100 pages to begin, and then there's a lot of uh, detours and too many names. And, I mean, it, that's okay, but, uh, for example, they are quite central in, in the school system. And I think we haven't dared to touch them enough. You know, we, we have to uh, have writers taking them and uh, not, not basically retell them, but mm. maybe make shorter editions. Because the language is not difficult. It, it's more maybe the, the, the structure of the story. So you don't have to translate them, no. but you just have to edit them a little bit. Of course, it has been done with, with uh, comic versions and stuff, but I would like to say, see more like prose versions of, of the sagas. But I mean, for me, they're, they're just a constant source of drama and humor. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, and who knows in the future, I will maybe take Gretis saga and you know, retell it or edit it my way. Mm. You also link them to rap poetry in your in the novel. Yes, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe more the the old rhyme tradition, yeah. and yeah, also the the skaldic uh, poetry in, in the sagas. And uh, yeah, I mean there is uh, there is a connection, and there have been attempts, really exciting ones, to to mix these genres. I would see, like to see more of it, <coughs> but there are endless possibilities of, of, of mixing these, uh, these types. Mm. If we go back to Sölvi and his per persona and his person and his character, he's 15 years old, he's going to be 16, he's living in the countryside with his grandmother and their very interesting neighbor, Thomas, also quite a character. And Thomas's niece, not niece, but granddaughter. Granddaughter. Yeah. Granddaughter Marta, who plays football and also a special lady. And obviously, being a young person at that age, being male, being uh, sex, is a very important factor in life mm -hmm. for us, all of us, of course, but especially for him. And uh, he, he's, uh, he keeps thinking about imagining things about sex and living in another mm -hmm. world, actually, mm -hmm. in order to get out of the real world. Yeah. I think it's, it's like the only, only time when he's at ease, when he sort of masturbates or something like that. Mm -hmm. but, I was, but he's also clicking at porn sites. Mm -hmm. 
And while reading your novel, I have, I have gone through the music, the musical okay. references, but also the pornographical sides. But I had to stop <laughs> yeah. for obvious reasons. But I think that's quite um, uh, from your point of view, because I'm taking these big conclusions and jumping from one thing to another now, but I was thinking about your students at school. Had they read the book? Yeah, many of them. Uh, and their reactions, and I, I mean, also in connection with this theme. Yeah, they know me. <laughs> uh, no, that, that's actually uh, uh, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite cor courses that I, I teach is about translation. Mm. And uh, I let them choose between uh, a couple of uh, texts. For example, I've taken chapters from this uh, brilliant uh, book called Pornland. Somebody of you might know it, uh, which is like a, just uh, where they, where they try to explain what this world is about mm. and uh, make some sense out of it. And so I have uh, gone into many discussions with students about the effects uh, that porn has mm. on our lives. And it has opened their eyes in a way because we always tend to go into these uh, extremes in, in discussions about the, these things that those who defend porn say that, I mean, nobody will be turned into a rapist by looking at a couple of porn sites. You know, we are, uh, we are good on the inside, etc. But uh, this book addresses the fact that the, va the values of porn, it seeps in gradually. And uh, I find it in a way so sad that, I mean, not many people are aware of this, but many kids and not just kids, everybody is starting to believe the narrative of porn. Mm. Because porn, although we have billions of sites, and you could probably find something that's realistic and maybe beautiful as well. But there is only one story that is told that is about the, uh, the muscular young guy with yeah, quite a big penis. Uh, yeah, not just quite a big, just enormous. <laughs> and then the, the willing... Uh, mm. slave woman who, who who screams at every opportunity and I think this is, is quite a luggage to carry you know when when you are a boy or a girl and boys uh, watch more porn than girls that's a fact that they have had hours and hours, hundreds of hours, thousands of hours of watching these stories and believing in them before they touch somebody for the first time mm. or kiss somebody for the first time. And this is, is just so tragic. And this is one of the themes, themes of the book. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, it's also related to, to uh, the... Uh, apprehension of love, what is love and how, how do you show love? Mm. And I think, uh, because this is also a book full of humor and sadness, but I think the scene when, when, when Selby finally is dancing together with uh, Marta, the girl, the football player at this party, when he's dr really drunk for the first time of his life, and everything is very romantic and beautiful, and then he says the, the awful line that destroys everything. How I, that I think it's a beautiful solution of it, and it's very dramatic. But um, yeah, could you comment upon that? Why did why why didn't you leave him alone? <laughs> why why yeah. did you have to destroy it? Yeah, exactly. Um, maybe th this is a spoiler. I'm not sure. I mean, there were I think two or three who hadn't read the book. <laughs> yeah, never mind. But. Uh, 
that, uh, that scene where there seemed to be something romantic in the air that he destroys by, by just directly asking her to sleep with him, in a way, that this is just his inability mm. to cope with the situation that, I mean, how on earth are you going to cope with this reality when you have the only thing you know is it comes from uh, this the story of how the sexes meet in, in this virtual world that where on earth do you start i mean if it if it doesn't come gradually that you know you you st you're around girls or boys and you you touch there are some games there is some kissing there's some holding hands mm. etc but what have you, in a way, that you have been isolated and you've been deprived of, or you have deprived yourself of everything. And then at the age of 15 or 16, you are there with, uh, with someone you're interested in. What, how on earth are you going to react? It must be, it must start with something tragic in a way. Hmm. And I'm glad you did, like you did in the book, because it's not a Hollywood movie. It's not the traditional not way, not, not yet. yet, but it might be. <laughs> I agree on that. And um, yeah, one other thing that comes to my mind is violence. Because in fact, you have, you have a, a lot of all these um, components that we normally find in young adult fiction, but it's always pinpointed and always one or two problems that are addressed. But in your books, you sneak in the problems within the story. So you actually you don't see them during when you read for the first time. But if you start close reading, you say, aha, you can, I mean, you have, you have, uh, I won't go into everything you have. I want to speak about violence, in fact, because, and the relationship to, to, um, Freyr, mm. because there's violence creeping in to his mind, to Selvi's mind from the very beginning of the book, and then it mm. pops up every now and then. Mm. Uh, violence and boys, yeah, that's... When I was growing up, uh, there, was, there was quite a lot of violence in a way. I mean, it was this... It was depicted maybe later as being, you know, just boys fighting somehow. Mm. But there was always some some fighting and and fists flying and and uh, every day somebody was uh, getting into a fight at school. Um, violence in this book, um, this his nemesis in a way. Mm this person called Frey, yeah. uh, which is, I wouldn't say a, like a symbol for <laughs> evilness, but is somehow everything Selvi both loves and uh, hates and admires mm. in a way. And I'm not sure how to talk about the violence in the book. Uh, there is this, this anger inside him um he doesn't have an outlet for his his feelings mm. and um, he has been cornered in a way at school by this freyr and his friends and he is uh, you could call it mobbing or whatever but i mean i'm not sure how to uh, address it at the moment but in a way it's uh, he is a very passionate character. He is very uh, emotional, but like I said, he has been with himself and his thoughts and his video games and his porn mm. for the best part of his life. And for moments, he is bound to explode, Yeah, both verbally and physically. Yeah. Yes, he's a very lonely person in yeah, a way. Yeah. And, and he's, he's also um, observing himself all the time. Mm. It's as if he were a character in a movie that he's watching yeah. and comments upon. Yeah. And I, I very much like the portrayal of Selvi and especially his, his uh, loneliness mm. and his uh, 
his urge to hide at the same time as he knows that he has to go out. Yeah. And he's even, uh, he's even prepared to sit in a small flat when he's getting older and just watching yeah. things going on and pass away, mm -hmm. which is very, very sad. Yeah, I think we, we're living interesting times uh, when it comes to being alone, being with others, being alone and with others, that we fear loneliness. And uh, I mean, he, in a way, in the, in the countryside, he learns to deal with it. He, he doesn't gets, get friends with it, in a way, but he has the courage just to, in a way, to look it in the eye. Uh, and I think uh, many children, and not just children, uh, everybody today, I mean, when do you have a moment just with yourself and look loneliness in the eye and, you know, just try to cope with it or and just not try to uh, uh, put a blanket over it with... Uh, with entertainment or alcohol or drugs, mm. you know, when, I mean, how do we deal with loneliness? I mean, we, people are very reluctant today to seek uh, or, or go spiritual ways. Uh, the churches are more or less closed and they, they don't seem to reach young people or anybody today, but there's a, there's a, such a huge spiritual uh, need out there and uh, you can try endlessly to uh, to soothe your loneliness with entertainment but it only grows deeper in a way so in a way uh, Selvi in the country said he I think he is on a on a spiritual journey in a way uh, through literature through poetry and who knows what, what happens then? Hmm. You say, who knows what happens then? And you begin the novel in medias res, the, the, in the very beginning. It's a conversation between mother and son. And you also end the novel in, out in the open. We don't know. It's not like the traditional happy ending. It's it, the life goes on, the flow goes on. Hmm. And as a reader, I want to know more. So will I be able to find out something more about Selvi? Yeah, actually, I'm working on a, a sequel, but that, that was never the idea. Uh, I thought it was a perfect ending, you know, or let, not a perfect ending, but the end. Yeah. But when I, uh, when I finished the book, and uh, a couple of months later, when I started writing again, I just wanted to continue. And... Uh, uh, I finished the, like the first manuscript and I, I hope it will appear in a year's time or something. Uh, I'm a quite slow. It's a slow process. But uh, in the next book, he uh, he's on the move again. He moves to my hometown in the north and there could be int interesting scenes, like he could meet me in the book, maybe. <laughs> maybe I will teach him or something. So maybe we'll get friends, be become friends. But uh, it's a, it's the joy of my life to to write about uh, this boy and the, these characters, and I just couldn't let go <laughs> with with uh, with this one. I had to I had to keep on going. I'm happy to hear about that. Now I wonder, I haven't checked the time. Do we have time still? We don't have time. <laughs> oh, we don't, I would, I have so many questions. But next time. Thank you for listening. Thank, Thank you, you for much. sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you.